going to be an interesting discussion and some counterpoints to both what Fazila said and what Fayo said. And then we'll have a nice little discussion. I, I want to make a theoretical argument, and hopefully in that theoretical argument, address some of these, uh, some of these issues. Um, my point of departure is that there was a foundational flaw in our conception of the transition itself and what this post-apartheid society would look like. And the role of the media has to be understood, it seems to be, within the, the framework of that foundational conceptual flaw. The conception, this conceptual flaw is that we conceived of the transition to democracy in exclusively, almost perhaps 100 percent, in political and economic terms. The idea was that we were going to obtain political freedom, and having obtained political freedom, then we were going to empower our people economically. And that, that was the, really the extent of the debate. What this did, of course, it made possible the occlusion, if you like, of racism as a cultural process of dehumanization, not in its origins as a response or as a, a, um, a weapon for economic expo exploitation. But that racism in and of itself needs to be interrogated, and it should have been interrogated at the very beginning. And what happened as a result of this occlusion of democracy as a cultural process, of nation building as a cultural process, um, which, which um, Benedict Anderson described as the creation of an imagined community, an imagined community that is imagined out of a sense of collective values, which are cultural values in the broader sense of culture, and a part of broader processes of identity formation. That process, as a process that requires attention in and of itself, not as a proxy for fighting poverty, not as a proxy for fighting inequality, but as, as required, intrinsically its own attention. So the theoretical argument I'm going to make here is that we need to deal with racism as a social phenomenon in and of itself and locate the role of the media within that conceptual framework. Now why am I saying this? It seems to me that we have to begin where Fazila began in the 17th, 18th century. Right? With, the, with the rise of racism and the origins of racism. And racism did not, and I contest what she was saying, did not emerge as a process designed as part of economic exploitation of people in Africa or elsewhere in the world. That came later. Racism emerged within the natural sciences in the 17th century and 18th century. It, it emerged as the enlightenment was beginning to, create, to gain ground. And when science was becoming the medium for interpreting the world, and natural scientists were beginning to embrace this idea that the world, the social world, could also be classified, could also be objectified and could also be ranked. And, and, and those ideas of looking at the natural world were, were actually quite revolutionary and very new in the way that human beings looked at society. And, and those ways of looking at the world in the natural and the physical sciences were then extended by biologists and physicians and natural scientists to interpretation now, not only of the physical world, but of the social world. And so just as the scientists could rank flowers and could rank animals and could rank all kinds of things in the world, they began to focus on whether they could actually rank human beings as well. 
and people like Francis Panier and a whole lot of other people began this process of ranking human beings and actually attaching value to human beings. And the most important concept in all of this was the notion of beauty. What is beautiful? So racism emerges as an aesthetic, as an aesthetic uh, phenomenon in the world, in and of itself. And, and, and Cornel West has written quite prolifically about, about how this then becomes part of what he calls the structure of modern discourse, of who deserves to be called beautiful and deserving, and who has value. And for some reason, these European um, scientists and social scientists, they pick on the most insignificant genetic variation in human beings, that which produces melanin. Something that developed as, 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 as Africa, as people generally originally were protecting themselves against the sun. I mean, melanin is basically a result of the human body protecting itself against ultraviolet rays of the sun. But because melanin was a visible social marker, it assumed a, a disproportionate significance for these scientists, because now you can actually mark out certain people as not beautiful. And before this invention, the funny thing is that before this invention, for millennia, right up until the Italian Renaissance, blackness was viewed as the ultimate representation of beauty. Right up until the Italian Renaissance. But this changes in the 19th and, 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 the, and, the, and the 18th century because of of these changes in the structure of modern discourse. Now, why does the media matter in all of this? Because the media then carries these images of black people. There's a wonderful series that has been just produced at Harvard University called The Image of the Black in Western Art. It's volumes and volumes. And it's about how black people have been represented historically over time. And so, in South Africa, what then began to happen is that as we moved away from any interrogation of race as a social phenomenon in its own right, as we moved away from that, and we started talking about poverty, and we started about everything else under the sun, except racism, racism itself. And when we did that, 20 years down the line, a vacuum has evolved. Because our newspapers, our columnists, began to rewrite the script. And the script was now no longer the question of racism. The script was now, you know, colonialism actually was not that bad for you guys. <laughs> you know, and after having declared, goes on CNN and says, I believe it actually was not that bad. <laughs> Black people had democracy in the homelands. All right, and I'm, making, I'm not making this up. He actually said these things. So you've got all these columnists, all these writers who've got this sense of entitlement about how to interpret the black experience and the social world. But as they do so, it seems to me that it's important to look at their practice as actually an age-old practice of the structure of modern discourse that Cornell writes about. That this is nothing new. That this de description of black people as less beautiful, as less deserving of, 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 of good treatment, as less virtuous, needs treatment on its own on its own terms because it has it has it, it's a tradition that goes back for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so to the extent that the media has, has, has played or not played the role, and this applies to black and white I think, to the extent that we have failed in this country for the past few years to interrogate racism on its own terms as a social phenomenon on its own, it will continue to fester. Thank you.